Hello, I am Bewilderbeast, and this is Twilight Princess Any%. Percent. This run starts off pretty quickly, so I'll go into talking about the category more generally and outlining the run in a few minutes. But first we get to start off the run with Back in Time, which will take a little bit of explanation. In a casual playthrough, the player would be expected to get Epona, bring her to Orden Village, and do a few tasks on what we call Orden Day 1 like herding goats, getting the fishing pole, getting the slingshot, and so forth. But by clipping through this gate using a rock, we can skip all of that stuff and go on to what we call Orden Day 2. This also allows us to void, which is very important for the trick called Back in Time. The way this works is I'm going to jump off the side of the bridge and void and reset the console at the same time, on the exact same frame. It is a frame-perfect trick. And when Link voids, the game tries to respawn him. When you reset the console, the game tries to load the title screen. So it does both at the same time and loads Link on the title screen with the player still in control. From there, I'm voiding once to get rid of the splash screen and making a save. And on the save file, I'll have all of the things that Link has on the title screen. He'll be wearing the hero's clothes. He'll have a sword, kind of. We'll get into that a little bit more later. And most importantly, something that's a little more subtle is that the flag will be set for Link having tamed Epona. And that's something that's not supposed to have happened until a lot farther into the story, and it'll allow us to get the iron boots early. Alright, that was a lot right at the very beginning, but this next section goes a little bit more the way the developers intended. We're going to talk to Koro to get the lantern, our first item, and we're going to use it to navigate to save Tallow, which again is something that would normally happen on Orden Day 2 after having gotten the Orden Sword from Link's house, but we skipped all of that. So I think now would be a good time to talk a little bit more about the category in general. This is a true any percent category, there are no restrictions. Unlike, say, Majora's Mask or Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess doesn't have any extremely game-breaking glitches that we know of yet. There are quite a few sequence breaks, both major and minor, and although Twilight Princess speedruns have kind of a reputation for not changing very much over time, just because so many big sequence breaks were found pretty much as soon as the game came out, the speedrun is in fact always developing, as all speedruns are, and this run does include some things that are new to any percent or weren't seen very much in any percent before, such as Stallard Skip and Norgor. Looking at the goals for this run, obviously the end goal is to defeat the final boss, Ganon. And to get into Hyrule Castle, we, at the time of recording, theoretically have a barrier skip now, using actor unloading, but it's only theoretical, no one's done it on console yet and won't be a part of this run. So to get to Hyrule Castle, we'll need to beat Palace of Twilight, and to get there, we'll need to beat Arbiter's Grounds and get the final mirror shard from City in the Sky. To get to Arbiter's Grounds, we're going to need to beat Lakebed Temple, and to do that, we're going to need to beat some Twilights and get some equipment. So for anyone keeping track, this early game is all in an effort to beat Lakebed Temple. I'd also like to talk a little bit about movement in the game here as I'm rolling through Farron to save Tallow. Rolling is our fastest movement option as human in Twilight Princess, and in most cases, chaining rolls frame perfectly is optimal, so I'll be trying to do that most of the time. If you really want to keep track of whether I'm doing that or not, you can look at the HUD in the top right corner where the lantern is equipped, and if the lantern flashes a brighter color, that means I did not chain rolls frame perfectly, but if it stays dim, then I did. Saving Tallow both requires breaking the cage that Tallow and the monkey are in, and killing the two Bokoblins that are guarding the cage. And in this category, this is fairly straightforward. I have a sword, so I'm just going to roll up here, kill the Bokoblins, and slash the cage to break it. I took this for granted until I ran 100%, where we don't have a sword at this point, so we need the Bokoblins to break the cage, and luring them over there is a real pain. Fortunately, in 100%, we have a slingshot to kill the Bokoblins afterwards, but in another of our categories, any percent no save and quit, you wouldn't have a sword or a slingshot there. So what one would need to do is use the Bokoblins to break the cage, then push them all the way across the map to Trill, uh, the bird selling lantern oil, who would then kill them. So I'd say we had a pretty easy time with that. Now, as I said before, saving Tallow is our ticket to Orden Day 2. And on Orden Day 2, we have a scripted event that is uh, herding 20 goats. This unfortunately has a pretty major RNG component, although the goats always start off in the same locations and facing the same directions. The way that they react to Link is just RNG. So I've got a path I'm going to go on here, hopefully it'll work out and I'll herd the goats in under 20 seconds. 
That is ideal. My best goat's time ever is a low 16. But other people have gotten 15s before, and a task can get a 14. 1750 is pretty good. After herding these goats in a casual playthrough, one would head to the sewers to become a wolf and continue the story that way, but we've got a pit stop to make along the way, at Bo's house. I mentioned before that Back in Time was going to allow us to get the iron boots early, and again the way it does that is by setting the flag for Epona being tamed. In a casual playthrough, this would happen after completing the Elden Twilight and when getting ready to go to Goron Mines, and afterwards Minda would direct Link to go back to Orden Village to figure out how to beat the Gorons and get into the mines. The way to do that is the iron boots, and since we have that flag set, we can now wrestle bow for the iron boots. This means that we won't need to return to Orden Village at any point in the rest of the run. One kind of glitchy side effect of this is that we still need to advance through all of Bo's text that he would have in the cutscene before wrestling him for the iron boots, but instead of the cutscene playing, the camera moving, and the text coming up automatically, we have to initiate all of it. Wrestling Bo is another RNG component of the run, it's essentially a game of weighted rock paper scissors. And if I'm lucky, Bo will let me slap him, and then I'll be able to mash A quickly enough to one-cycle him to push him off of the ring without having to slap or get pushed by him again. That was the one-cycle, and that requires mashing A over around 12 times per second. Let's go again! Now we receive the second item of the run, the Iron Boots. One interesting thing about the item wheel, which we'll be equipping items to the X and Y buttons off of in this game, is that the top item on it is always going to be the item that Link is supposed to have received most recently in the game's progression. Since in a casual playthrough one would get the boomerang before getting the Iron Boots, the Iron Boots are going to stay at the top of the item wheel even after we get the boomerang. I did just save my game there, and it's not because I'm worried about dying. It's because I'm going to need a save file in this state of Orden Village for a trick later on. Now, as I mentioned before, we will head to the sewers and become a wolf. Spoilers. I'll note as I get a rupee in this upcoming tunnel, that the only thing rupees are used for in this entire run is paying fire to fix the sky cannon to get to city in the sky, and we'll need 300 rupees for that, which conveniently is our maximum capacity for the default wallet, we don't need to get any wallet upgrades, but it does mean that we'll need to route in some rupees over the course of the run. We now reach probably the least important trick in the entire run, Box Break. I'm going to attempt to break that box in the corner by timing a combo to coincide with the cutscene beginning. And I failed it! Oh no. Getting that Box Break saves a few frames. Next is the sewer sequence, where we learn how to be Wolf Link and learn how to do midna jumps from place to place, which of course will be used in the rest of the run. I spoke before about the basics of movement as human link, and now a few notes about movement as wolf link. In most cases, dashing is the fastest form of movement as wolf, just pressing A and moving. There are some exceptions, which we'll get to a little bit later. One nuance of dashing as wolf link is that every time he dashes, a timer is set, and wolf link won't be able to dash again until that timer runs out. That means that if a dash gets interrupted by getting hit or jumping over something, then it's possible that Wolf Link won't be able to dash again immediately, which is very slow. So one thing I'll be paying attention to anytime I'm Wolf Link in this run is something called dash cancelling, 
It turns out that an exception to what I just said is that if Wolflink's dash gets interrupted within 10 frames of being initiated, then there is no wait time for him to be able to dash again. So to get off this ledge, for example, I'm going to initiate a dash, but then press B immediately afterwards to do an attack off of the ledge. Then I can dash again as soon as I get on the floor. In this section, the tower climb, there are a few minor time savers I'll be going for. First, I will try to talk to Midna here outside of her cutscene range, which will save a little bit of time over just running into the cutscene as normal. Then here, I'm going to jump just to the left of this platform and fall. Oh, I missed it. Well, the game requires you to fall there once and then come back around to do the jump. And if I had jumped a little bit farther to the left and not landed in the water, then I would have avoided the text box. The next very small time saver is when I go for the Midna jump after this one, there will be some text from Midna immediately preceding the jump. And there is one frame, this game loves one framers, there is one frame between the text box and the animation of Midna flying away where I can get the jump early. I got it on the last one actually, before I had a chance to point it out. Let's see if I get it on this one. Oh, jeez. Okay, I did get it there. We didn't see the animation of Minna flying away, and that's uh, really nice because the keys were going to get me otherwise. Here, oh, this text box is skippable too. That's another one frame input. I had to press start and then A on the very next frame. And I timed that, and I usually get it, but didn't get it there. There's a third animation skip here, and I didn't get it, so you see I had to wait a little bit after Minna talked to Link uh, to get the jump. Who could this mysterious cloaked figure be? I hope I didn't need to watch that cutscene to find out. If the game seems to be making no sense right now, it's just because I'm skipping all of the cutscenes, which is a very nice feature of this game for speedruns. We're now coming up on the next big trick in the run. This is called Sword and Shield Skip. And the name alone raises some questions. Why do we need to skip the sword and the shield? We already have a sword and shield. You can see them plainly on Link's back. Well, because we got the sword and the shield using that back in time save at the very beginning of the run, the game doesn't actually know that we have them. If I were to open up the pause screen right now and look at the equips, you wouldn't see the sword or the shield. As far as the game is concerned, we don't have them. Now, this isn't a problem for actually using the sword and the shield, but it does mean that before we can enter the next area of the game, Farron, we still have this text trigger from Midna that tells us, hey, you don't have the sword and the shield yet, you'd better go back to Orden and get those before you progress. At this point, we're actually locked out of getting the sword and the shield the normal way, so what we're going to have to do instead is jump over that text trigger that's on the ground and hit the air trigger that's above and a little bit beyond it to enter Farron. To do that, we're going to need the assistance of this friendly Bulblin, which the community has named Hugo. What I need to do is push him into a very specific spot and then do some attacks on him in a very specific way. Doing so gave Link a very large jump and allowed him to completely bypass the Midna text trigger. I will say, in case anyone watching this is wanting to speedrun this game at some point, that that trick, Sword and Shield Skip, is pretty tough, and it's pretty early on in the run. So if you're learning the run, try not to get discouraged by that. I always recommend that new runners make a save after getting the trick for the first time so that they can keep moving on with learning the game rather than just trying to work on that trick at first. Since we skipped the Orden Warp Portal, this is our first Shadow Beast fight. All of the Shadow Beast fights we'll see in this run, aside from the ones in Palace of Twilight, which are a little bit different, include three to five Shadow Beasts, and they're essentially just puzzles. The trick is that you can never leave one of them standing, or else it'll roar and call the other ones back to life. So this is a scripted loss. I can't kill all of them at once yet. But as soon as I talk to Midna here, I'll learn how to do the Midna charge attack, and using that, I will be able to kill the last two at once. It is also possible to complete these fights using the sword as human, 
but I can't transform back into human yet, and in any case, I did need to learn the mid to charge attack for some things I'll do later. In a casual playthrough or in a speedrun of a different category of this game, one would now talk to Farron to get the Farron vessel and kill the bugs along the way. But we're not going to do that in this category, we're actually going to be able to escape Farron without completing the Twilight or completing Forest Temple. To do that we're going to need the boomerang, so we're kind of on our way to get that now, but on our way we're going to have to make an important stop. One thing I like about this game is how it reuses areas in different contexts, so while in the beginning of my run I had to roll through this tunnel as human, I can now dig across the bulk of it as wolf. And that short animation you just saw of Midna falling onto Wolf Link's back is skippable, yet another one-framer. If I had pressed A on the correct frame, digging out of that hole, then I could have skipped that short animation. Speaking of which, I didn't get that quick jump either. That's unfortunate. I personally mash for all of these one-frame animation skips. There are one-frame tricks later on in the run that I will not mash for, that I will time, because they're far more important. I mentioned before we'd be taking a quick detour on our way to the boomerang. That quick detour is to get the Master Sword, which in a casual playthrough one would only be able to get after beating Lakebed Temple. We've only been playing the game for 15 minutes or so. But we're already near the area where you can get the Master Sword, and if I can just get out of bounds with a super jump off of this Shadow Beast, then I can run a little bit out of bounds and then jump all the way to the Sacred Grove, where I'll be able to get the Master Sword now. This is a huge sequence break, and is good for the speedrun because there are a lot of benefits to having the Master Sword, which I'll go over a little bit later. Howling at the Stone initiates the Skull Kid chase sequence. We'll have to find Skull Kid at three different locations throughout the Grove, and then do a final fight with him. Fortunately, although the grove is very convoluted, Skull Kid always appears at the same places, so I know exactly where he is ahead of time. As a note about Rupee Collection, you saw that I just got two green rupees from grass but ignored them and ran on. Green rupees in general are not worth spending any time getting in this run, because we have plenty of rupees later on that we can get. We do want to get at least 40 rupees before we get to Arbiter's Grounds, but if we can get up to 60 rupees by then, then we can skip one of the rupees we would get in that dungeon. Skipping that rupee only saves a few seconds, so going out of our way to get green rupees is just not worthwhile. And now I'll enter this arena to have the final fight with Skull Kid. All I'll need to do is again hit Skull Kid three times around the arena. While doing this, I will attempt to get some rupees without wasting any time. I will also need to kill at least one of the puppets on each round in order to get Skull Kid to progress to the next round. And I'll try to kill exactly one of them per round, because as you can see, anytime I hit an enemy, there's this kind of hit stun effect where the whole game lags for a few frames. And if I were to hit more than one enemy, then the game would do that multiple times and cost me some time.
Lastly, before we can get the Master Sword, we'll need to complete this puzzle, which, again, thankfully I already know the solution to. This puzzle is kind of a doozy if you don't already know the solution. And now, just over 21 minutes into the run, I'm obtaining the Master Sword. I mentioned before that there are a number of benefits to having the Master Sword early, and to name a few, it'll allow us to transform between Human and Wolf Link at will. It will allow us to use our warp portals whenever we want to. It will be good for combat, as it is stronger than the Orden Sword, deals more damage. And it will allow us to get into Lakebed Temple early, because when Link has the Master Sword, the game assumes he's already beaten Lakebed, and will allow a save warp from the underwater portion of the first room of the dungeon to bring Link to land in the first room of the dungeon, which is very convenient as it allows us to skip getting the Zora armor completely, though we will have to find some other means for breathing underwater for the Morpheal fight and a phase of the Zant fight. This is, unfortunately, one of the longest unskippable cutscenes in the run, but it does give us a chance to admire Midna's tiny nose. She's also showing us this crystal that was embedded by Zant into Link's forehead after he beat Lakebed Temple, which won't happen for at least another hour in the run. It's a bit of sequence breaking there. Now we're really off to get the boomerang, which is in the forest temple, and unfortunately to get there we're going to have to warp back to South Farron, even though North Farron is closer. We had to leave the Shadow Beasts alive in North Farron because we used one of them to get to the Master Sword early. So we're going to make our way back there first, get the warp portal, and then enter the forest temple. I mentioned before that I appreciate the reuse of some areas in the game, as this area looked totally different before when Human Link was rolling through it at the very beginning of the run, but it does get to be a little bit confusing around this area of the run. I've already come through this area once, now I've got to come through it again, but instead of going to get the Master Sword, I'm going to go to the Forest Temple, and then later I'm going to be coming through this area two more times, doing the trick known as Farron Escape. I'd be lying if I said I had never tried to go do Farron Escape without having gotten the boomerang before. It happens sometimes. Earlier to cross this area, we used a series of mid jumps, but now because we can transform, it'll be a little bit faster to transform into human here, and use our lantern to dispel the purple mist so we can roll through it. In a casual playthrough, a monkey would have stolen Link's lantern and guided him through the purple mist, but because we haven't completed the twilight yet, the monkey isn't there, so we've just got to do it ourselves. Now we're back in the arena where we did the early Master Sword trick, however this time we're just going to complete the Shadow Beast fight. As I mentioned before, we can do this as human. Uh, oh no. Sometimes the Shadow Beasts like to inspect the walls and make sure they're still there. Good work, Shadow Beast. Yep, 
You may notice that I still have the lantern out at this point, and the only reason for that is that it would have taken me a split second to put it away. And because we don't need the lantern for very much in this run, we have plenty of oil, it doesn't really matter that I have it out right now. Upon entering Forest Temple, we'll see this run's second and final use of Back in Time. However, this time we'll be using it for a pretty different purpose. The trick will start off the same as earlier, I'm going to void and reset the console on the same frame. To do that here, I'm going to need to jump attack out of bounds from a pretty specific spot. And I'm saving now so that I can come back to the Forest Temple after all of this is done. Now I'm voiding and resetting the console on the same frame, which will allow Link to spawn on the title screen. But this time, as I void on the title screen, I'm going to open the file select screen and load a file. And this will give us a wrong warp into the King Boltlin 1 fight sequence. From there, I'm going to reset the console again and skip the cutscene at the same time. And that will conclude this trick. Now what just happened was, by entering the King Boblin fight and skipping the cutscene, I set a flag in the game related to boss fights, and that flag also controls how many monkeys we have in the Forest Temple. See, in a casual playthrough, one would be expected to go around and save all the monkeys in order to proceed through the dungeon. But with that flag set to a high enough value, the game will simply give me the monkeys I need to go fight the mini-boss and get the boomerang early. Now, getting into the dungeon, this room is a little bit awkward because I don't have the slingshot having skipped Orden Day 1. So as a result, I'm going to be killing the Deku Babas in the room and throwing the nuts that they drop at the spiders to get up the wall. If I'm lucky... No, I won't go for it with this. If I get lucky, then that spider that's remaining on the wall will be facing a direction such that I can just maneuver past it without it noticing me, and skip killing the second Baba, but it didn't work out this time. And you may have noticed, as soon as I got to the top of the vines and start walking, and after this door, I'm going to do a little bit of a side walk before I start rolling. I mentioned earlier that chaining rolls frame perfectly is in many cases the optimal way to move. But if chaining rolls from a standstill, Link won't actually reach his full roll speed until the third roll, so incorporating some walking is useful. And now I've got four monkeys somehow. The power of back in time. The flag I set to give myself the monkeys does have effects on other bosses as long as it's still active, and entering most boss or mini boss fights will clear the flag, but conveniently getting the monkeys here will still leave the flag set to a high enough value that we'll be able to use it for Deku Toad later on in the Lakebed Temple. Now we've finally reached the boomerang. To get it, we're going to need to defeat Ook, the mini-boss of the Forest Temple. Ook hops a random number of times around the arena before throwing the boomerang at Link. Once he is finished hopping, we'll knock him off the pillar. And conveniently, because we have the Master Sword, we can defeat Ook in one cycle. In a casual playthrough, one would merely have the Orden Sword here, and it would take two cycles to defeat Ook. This is also present in Twilight Princess HD speedruns, as they do not have the early Master Sword trick. While one cycling Ook is fast and definitely good for the speedrun, it is a little unfortunate that we only get to hear the music for a few seconds, as the Ook music is unique to this mini-boss fight. We will at least get to hear a remix of it later on in the Zant fight, though. The standard template for dungeons in this game, and in Zelda games in general, is that Link must find and fight a mini-boss in order to obtain the dungeon item, then use it to solve some puzzles to make his way to the final boss. While we do need the boomerang for a lot of tricks that are coming up, we don't actually need to beat this dungeon to beat the game. So as soon as I get the boomerang, I'll be save warping to get back to the beginning of the dungeon and then leaving. It's common in some other games to see death warps, where the player would die intentionally in order to be teleported back to the beginning of a dungeon or some other advantageous position. However, in Twilight Princess, dying in a dungeon simply reloads the room that Link was in when he died, and that's not terribly useful. So in this run, there are actually no intentional deaths. As for why we don't need to beat this dungeon, well, in this part of the story, Link is supposed to be collecting the three fused shadows that are in the Forest Temple, the Goron Mines, and Lakebed Temple. Conveniently for speedrunners, though, the game only checks for the final fused shadow of the set. So if we beat Lakebed Temple, which houses the third fused shadow, then we can progress in the game as though we had beaten all three of the first dungeons. This will also happen in the second half of the game, where we only get the final mirror shard instead of getting all of them. 
So we can get by without beating the forest temple, but one problem that arises as a result is that Midna tries not to let Link leave Farron without both beating the forest temple and completing the twilight. We haven't done either of those two things in the run, but what we can do instead is jump over the trigger. We won't need an enemy to do it this time like we did for Sword and Shield Skip, we'll just use the boomerang. I will need to get in a pretty precise position here to do this, right up against the trigger. And then I'm just going to throw the boomerang and do a jump attack while targeting the boomerang, so that Link jumps very far. This is a piece of tech called the Long Jump Attack, or LJA, and it's most of the reason that we just got the boomerang. When Link is targeting an enemy or object that is over a void or over ground higher than Link's feet, and he does a jump attack, the speed of his jump attack will be greater than the speed of a normal jump attack. This seems to be an intended mechanic of the game for use with enemies, but we can exploit the fact that Link is automatically targeting the boomerang when he throws it to get the same effect with a boomerang throw, and in this way use the long jump attack to cross gaps that we're not really supposed to be able to cross. Another example is coming up right here. On my way to Elden, the postman is supposed to stop and deliver some mail to me, but if I stand right up against the postman's trigger, and do a long jump attack using the boomerang out of bounds of the wall, I can jump right over it and skip the postman. Here we'll be entering the third main region of the game, which is Elden, with the goal of getting to Kakariko to start and then complete the Elden Twilight. However, we are going to run into a problem getting to Kakariko. Another side effect of not beating the Forest Temple or Farron Twilight earlier is that we won't be able to warp the bridge from Farron to the Gorge that would normally be used to cross it and get to Kakariko. So instead, we will be doing some interesting acrobatics. Our first order of business is going to be to defeat the Shadow Beasts that are in front of the Gorge. We'll never actually be using this warp portal, but this Shadow Beast fight in particular is very important because almost immediately after the fight ends, Midna will grant Link the ability to warp with the map, Later on in the run, we'll need to do this in order to warp the Sky Cannon. The other thing though is that Minna also forces us to warp away after this fight, and warping away at this point would be very detrimental to our route, it would force us to do a lot of backtracking. Luckily there is one frame between the portal forming and the Midna text coming up to warp us away, where we can input a jump attack to void into the gorge, and skip that text trigger. Again, we will need map warping later, so we will be coming back to hit that text trigger, but it's better for us to not warp away now. And now for the acrobatics I mentioned earlier. We want to get across the gorge to get to Kakariko, but we don't have a bridge. So we'll take advantage of the fact that high-valued rupees give Link a text box telling him what they are. So we'll do a boomerang LJA with a rupee in the boomerang to get up on top of a fence and get that text, preventing Link from falling off immediately. This will then allow us to roll over to the other side of the fence, and carefully make our way over to the gorge. From here we can do a longer range and much more spectacular long jump attack to make it all the way over the gorge, and get to Kakariko. There's one more obstacle in our way. Just past this fence, there's a large load zone for the same King Boblin fight that we wrong warped into earlier, and we don't want to hit that now, there's no reason to do that fight. But conveniently, the load zone does not actually extend all the way to the edges of the area, so we can simply run around it. This Shadow Beast fight opens the Kakariko Warp Portal, and that means that we can come back here anytime we want. We still do need to go back to the Gorge though at some point to hit that Midna text trigger and get map warping. So we'll do that now, as it turns out to be a little bit faster to do it now than to do it after Elden Twilight. On our way out of Kakariko, we will still need to avoid the King Bulbin one load zone by running around it. And I took that unfortunately slowly, I was trying to be careful, but that was kind of overkill. Very fortunately for us, that Midna text trigger exists on this side of the gorge as well, so we simply have to run back to it. As far as I know, there is no reverse rupee roll, where we could get back to the other side of the gorge easily. Yeah. Yeah. 
Since we're now being forced to warp back to Farron, as Midna expects us to bring the bridge that we can't access at this point back to the gorge, we're going to make the most of it and head over to Lanayru next. I will need to escape Farron again with another LJA. The main difficulty with this trick is that we need to be right up against the trigger, and it's hard to develop a good visual cue for it since there are just smudges on the ground. And it is unfortunate that we need to do it twice in the run, but on the flip side, if I were to fail to gorge void the single frame jump attack into the gorge earlier, then I would have ended up needing to do Farron escape a third time. At this point in the run, and in some other points later on, I'm just going to be running forwards for a while, and I'll pan the camera down towards the ground to reduce lag a little bit. It isn't intended for the player to be able to reach the Lanayru region this early in the story. In a casual playthrough, one would need to beat Goron mines and get a bomb bag in order to blow up some rocks and get there. But it turns out, with some careful alignment and by bonking a gate, Wolflink can simply side hop through the gate that prevents access. We will eventually also need to beat the Lanayru Twilight, but we're not ready for that yet. In order to start that, we're going to have to beat the Elden Twilight, but this will help us prepare for that and we'll be making a pit stop for another important item, the Claw Shot. The Claw Shot is the dungeon item for Lake Bed Temple, and normally getting to Lake Bed Temple requires not only getting the bomb bag, but also getting water bombs to fill it, and obtaining the Zora armor, which will allow Link to breathe underwater. We don't have either of these things yet, so we'll have to enter the dungeon in a very special way, called Pillar Clip. We're going to use a pillar that is near the entrance to the dungeon to clip Link out of bounds, and then use the iron boots to swim over to the entrance loading zone. Link has just enough air on his air meter for this to work. It is invisible, but the loading zone I'm aiming for is a cylinder surrounding the visible tunnel. And with very little air to spare, we have entered Lakebed Temple. I mentioned when we got the Master Sword earlier that that was important for entering Lakebed Temple. As you can see, as soon as I got into the dungeon, I was in a long underwater passageway, and I actually would have drowned before reaching the end of it. However, because I have the Master Sword, save warping brings me to the end of that tunnel and puts me on land. If I didn't have the Master Sword, I would be stuck there. In this first room of Lakebed Temple, we get to say hi to Purple Friend. Purple Friend jumped for joy at our greeting. See you later, Purple Friend. The intended way to get through the second room of the dungeon is to shoot bomb arrows at the stalactites causing them to fall and create platforms for Link. But we don't have the bow or bombs, so we're going to use some LJAs instead to get across the room. Unfortunately, I targeted that Helmosaur, otherwise I would have jump attacked straight onto this platform. I mentioned earlier that because we're not getting the Zora armor, we do need to find an alternative way to breathe underwater, and that is going to come in the form of bombs, but we don't have those yet, so we can't actually beat the dungeon right now, as fighting Morfield does require at least some way of breathing underwater. What we're going to do instead is completely prepare the dungeon for beating Morfield, and then use Uku to warp out of the dungeon and come back later. I'm now running up the stairs to get Uku from a pot, and in order to skip turning the staircase some more, I'll get to do a neat jump onto one of the lower floor's awnings. That done, we'll now make our way to the mini-boss room to get the dungeon item, the claw shot.
and to get there we're just going to skip a substantial portion of the dungeon with LJAs. I think in a way it's unfortunate that we get to skip so much of this dungeon because there's a lot to it and really it feels just like a boss key skip, but at least we have some other dungeons in the run that will feel more complete. I noted earlier that the flag we set to get monkeys early in Forest Temple could be used for other mini bosses and bosses as well, and I haven't done anything since then to clear that flag, so although the Deku Toad fight is supposed to only start if Link enters from the bottom of the room, we can instead enter from this easily accessible side of the room and start the fight anyway. Very similarly to the Ook fight, the Deku Toad fight is supposed to have multiple cycles, but because we have the Master Sword early and it deals extra damage, we will be able to one cycle this fight. This one is a little more tricky though, as Deku Toad only stays on the ground for a little while, and we need to fit 10 slashes into that time, without completing a combo. So I was carefully timing my slashes there to fit them all in. Very similarly to the forest temple, now that we've obtained the dungeon item, we'll be save warping and leaving the dungeon. We will need to beat Lake Bed Temple later, but again, we need some bombs first. Warping out of Lakebed Temple with Ugu brings us to the Lanayru Spring, and from here it'll be convenient to take the scripted Kargarok flight up to Zora's Domain, unlocking that warp portal for use later. In an ill-fated attempt to show us the Bulblin we must now fight, the camera will now show us an extreme close-up of some grass. There is a quick way of completing this fight, attacking the Kargarok twice and then killing the Bulblin Rider after it falls off, but because I already have the Master Sword, it's a little bit faster to do the fight in a different way, which is to lure the Kargarok into diving underwater, which kills the Bulblin Rider on top of it. So I'm going to wait for the Kargarok to come around, sink into the water with the iron boots, and drown the Bulblin Rider. This is a somewhat risky strat, as if done incorrectly, Link will get grabbed by the Kargarok, the game will try to play two cutscenes at once, and the game will crash. And as you can see, the Kargarok had to get pretty close to Link for that to work. Because we ended that sequence as human instead of wolf, you can see Wolf Link is not in the Kargarok's talons right now, so we'll transform right away. Interestingly, Human Link was spawned on this map on a high out-of-bounds ledge and moving him before transforming can be disastrous as he'll fall off off-camera. Now here I'm going to use one face of this rock wall to clip me through another face and get out of bounds. As you can see on the mini-map, this path takes a significant jog about two-thirds of the way through, and getting out of bounds allows us to take a much straighter path to the exit. Here is yet another single frame small time saver. I'm going to attempt to skip the cutscene and press A to jump attack on the very next frame. And now I can head to Zora's domain to open up the portal.
I mentioned in the sewers that when Midna gives Link a text box before allowing him to do a series of jumps, there is one frame where he can skip the animation of Midna flying away. This is the one exception to that. For some reason, on that text box, there was not a frame for input. It is unfortunately not possible to make it past these falling stalactites without pausing and waiting for them. And with that, I've obtained the Zora's Domain Warp Portal, which sets us up for quite a few things later on in the run. Now I can finally warp back to Kakariko and get on with the Elden Twilight. The Twilights in Twilight Princess are designed to be introductions to new areas in the game. So we'll mosey around the map killing 16 bugs to get Tears of Light to fill the vessel that just appeared on the right side of the screen. The first bug we'll kill is in the graveyard, but we're actually not going to collect the tier right away, because the bug takes a moment to explode and the tier takes a moment to become collectible. So in the meantime, we're going to transform into human and clip down into the sanctuary basement with a simple side hop. The collision for that cover is only designed for Wolf Link, as one is not supposed to be able to transform into a human at this point in the game. Careful setups, like the one I just used for those bugs, are important for not letting the bugs start to scurry around. The movement is RNG, so in a lot of cases, if we don't approach them in very controlled ways, then they'll start getting away and we'll lose a lot of time. Now on the way out, I will collect the tier from the first bug that we already killed, and head back to Kakariko proper. There's a setup for this bug as well. I'm going to bonk into the left wall and target it from down here, which will cause it to run straight to Link, instead of Link needing to climb up to get it. After lighting the fireplace in this room, I'll stand to the left of it so that the bug leaps down to the floor instead of landing on one of the platforms. And after killing it, I'm going to intentionally bonk on the counter out here, which will dislodge the bug on the upper floor. As we saw when I used a rupee to cross the gorge, getting high value rupees does give Link a text box, but if he side hops over it and reaches the rupee before the apex of the side hop, then the text is skipped. And to get out of here quickly, I'll do a couple of jumps, rather than climbing the ledges. Here's another one frame animation skip, and I got it. Coming up next is a trick called Bomb House Skip, 
After exiting the building that I'm currently entering, there will be a trigger at the top of the stairs that will cause a bug to run away and enter the bomb house, forcing Link to enter the bomb house afterwards and do a whole sequence where the bomb house explodes. Normally it's impossible to catch up to this bug before it enters the bomb house, but by doing a very careful jump over the railing, we'll be able to get ahead of it and kill it. This is possible both as Wolf Link and as Human using an LJA, but Wolf Link is a little bit faster. Now having killed this bug, the game will update the bomb house to look as though it has already exploded, though its collision is not updated yet. This bug, unfortunately, is impossible to kill until it leaves the corner. A charge attack would just go right through it, so I needed to wait. And now we enter Death Mountain Trail, which leads us to the reason that we needed to complete this twilight in the first place, which is the giant volcanic rock that falls in Death Mountain after completing Elden Twilight. That'll allow us to access Lanayru Twilight, Snow Peak, and a bomb bag. On this next ledge, I'll be going for a quick climb. You'll see that Link instantaneously gets up to the top. That happens because the climbing animation puts Link out of bounds and the game doesn't like that, so it just forces him back in bounds and skips it all together. There are just a few ledges in the run where this is going to be possible. This is our first Shadow Beast fight featuring more than three Shadow Beasts. We've got four this time. Makes it a little bit trickier, but not too tricky. This final bug is in an area infested with enemies, so instead of using the mid to charge attack to kill it, I'm just going to use some neutral B attacks. This prevents me from accidentally targeting the other enemies and flying around the arena without actually hitting the bug. This last tier completes our vessel and brings Elden out of the twilight state. Normally Link isn't allowed to be a wolf around human NPCs without getting some kind of reaction, but this is an exception as a result of skipping the King Bolden one fight earlier. Here is the giant volcanic rock we need to open up Lanayru. And we're forced to just wait for it to fall, but in the meantime we can transform into human in preparation for a cutscene skip in the next area. After I skip this cutscene, there is a one-framer for skipping some mid text. This one is somehow just the most difficult one. Yeah, I didn't get it. It feels like it's half a frame or something. Of course, that can't be the case. And now, using the iron boots, I'll swim out of this area, which doesn't look like much, but in fact does skip a long cutscene with Rutella, who is a fish ghost. A fun ramification of the game expecting us to only be Wolf Link here is that as Link exits this area, he will howl. 
despite being human. This is the same Linearu spring that we warped to with Uku when we left Lake Bed Temple, but now that we've melted the ice, it is time to actually get the vessel and start the Linearu Twilight. This twilight functions in essentially the same way that Elden Twilight did while we'll be going across the map to get 16 bugs. However, this one does last a little bit longer as this region is pretty large and ends in a boss bug fight rather than just having 16 normal bugs. These upcoming platforms are another clear example of dash cancelling. After a jump, I'm going to use a B attack to get right near the edge of the platform, and that way I can dash again and have my dash cancelled by the jump so I can dash again right after. Similarly to Rutella cutscene skip earlier, I'm going to swim out of this area with the iron boots, but this time it's for a different purpose. To skip a long series of Midna jumps in Zora's Domain, I'm going to attempt to side hop off of this waterfall to get to an upper area. There is a 3 frame window for inputting that side hop to land here. As I mentioned before, I've been approaching all of the bugs in very controlled ways, so that I can manipulate their RNG to allow me to kill them quickly, but these lily pad bugs are not exactly manipulable in that same way. Uh, the lily pads are also apparently very hard to climb onto. That wasn't too bad. With some good luck, the bugs will line up so that you can kill both of them with one attack. It's very quick. I'm rich! I'm ignoring that last rupee because I know at this point that I can't get up to 60 rupees, and as I pointed out before, it won't make a difference whether I get one more rupee or not at this point, since I already have over 40. Despite what I said earlier, I am going to instinctively check these boxes for rupees. It didn't matter though. And now we come to what is admittedly the least exciting part of the run, where I run straight for a little while.
Still running straight. Yes, sir. Making a turn. And then running straight some more. And now that we've gotten to this next area, I will continue to run straight. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, we made it to the Shadow Beast fight. This one is particularly tricky, as if you're not careful, the layout of the fence will cause Link to bonk between killing the last two Shadow Beasts, which will cause the fight to restart. Castletown does feature some unusual movement. In certain areas of the game, Wolf Link's speed is capped at a very low value. And in this particular area, the fastest way to move is by dash cancelling constantly. So I'm dashing and then immediately pressing B to cancel the dash so I can do it again. Here I can cut this corner and jump over to the ledge the bug is on. I can also bonk in a particular place to manipulate the bug to fall off the ledge quickly instead of taking its sweet time. Note here that I'm waiting for Link to turn blue before warping away. The game only considers Link to have obtained the tier when he turns blue, and warping away too early from this tier would incur minutes of time loss just backtracking to it. There are four bugs along the river in this Kargarok flight, and to take a quicker path, I'm actually going to skip the first one for now. I'm gonna fly right by it, kill the second one first, and wait for the first one to catch up to me. Optimally, one would dash with the Kargarok for the entire duration of this flight. However, I am going to delay some dashes to get within range of targeting the bugs. While it is possible to kill the bugs without targeting them, targeting them makes the Kargarok automatically fly towards them and kill them and missing the bugs can incur a lot of time loss. It's a little bit hard to tell where they are, too, because these bugs are larger than the normal ones, and the sense of scale is a little off. Having now gotten all four tiers from these bugs, I actually want to return to Lake Hylia, so I intentionally bonked there, and I'm going to tell Mitna no, I don't want to try the Kargarok flight again. Now we approach the boss bug fight. This is a unique bug fight in the game. Uh, the boss bug is very distinctive in that it is much, much larger than all the other ones. And there are some time savers throughout the fight that I'll be going for. On the first cycle, the bug will attack Link and Link will attack the bug and there you have it. On the cycles after this though, the bug will be charging at Link from across the lake. And by standing in a good place and manipulating the bug to come from a certain direction, I'll be able to hit the bug right as it turns vulnerable after finishing its attack, and that'll allow me to finish the cycle without waiting for the bug to fly away and then attack again.
Finishing the fight requires using a charge attack on the bug's legs, but we really don't need to hit all of them, just one. So I intentionally bonked after hitting the first leg in that charge attack to reduce the length of the animation. And with this 16th tier, we complete the vessel, finishing the Nehru Twilight. Having completed these Twilights, we have a lot more freedom to move throughout the overworld, and we can now move on to getting the items we need to get and completing the dungeons we need to complete to finish the game. The first task on our list is not exactly obvious, it's not an item to get or a dungeon to complete, but rather a hidden skill. There are seven sword techniques called hidden skills throughout Twilight Princess. And although for the most part they're not necessary and can be skipped, the first one, Ending Blow, is required to finish the game, as it's the only way to strike the final blow on Ganon in the final boss fight. Hilariously enough, you can actually make it all the way to the final boss fight without Ending Blow, and find yourself unable to finish the game. Shoutouts to Skyrion and Fennec. Now we're going to be getting Ending Blow in a pretty different way from how one would get it casually. In a casual playthrough, a golden wolf would appear outside the forest temple after completing Farron Twilight, and teach Link Ending Blow without him howling at a stone beforehand. Of course, as I've pointed out already, this run did not complete Farron Twilight, so that golden wolf never spawned. Thankfully, we don't actually need to talk to that golden wolf to get Ending Blow, we just need to talk to one of them, as the hidden skills will always be taught to Link in the same order, regardless of which wolves he sees first. So we're going to howl at this stone, which conveniently will place a golden wolf on the map next to Castletown, right where we'll spawn after beating Midna's Desperate Hour after Lakebed Temple. We have passed two other Howling Stones in the run so far, one outside the Sacred Grove and one in Death Mountain Trail during Elden Twilight, that we could have howled at to spawn a different golden wolf, but those golden wolves would have spawned at less convenient locations on the other side of Castletown. Here the map will automatically pop up, but there is one frame in which I can input a side hop. Very nice. Before the map comes up, that saves very little time. Next is another Shadow Beast fight for the warp portal at Upper Zora's River. We'll never actually warp to this portal, but we need to do this in order to talk to Iza to get our first bomb bag. In a casual playthrough, one would buy their first bomb bag from Barnes after beating Goron Mines, and then could get another bomb bag from Iza, and another bomb bag from the Goron that's underwater in Zora's Domain. Since this run doesn't beat Goron Mines, but does need bombs in order to breathe underwater, which again I'll get into later, we're going to have to get a bomb bag through some nefarious means. After the Shadow Beast fight, Iza is going to lend us her bomb bag so that we can blow up the rocks that are blocking the river. But, instead of helping her out, we're going to steal her bomb bag by warping away. The game normally doesn't allow Link to warp in front of NPCs, as I mentioned earlier, but this dialogue with Iza is automatically going to open the item wheel, and if I talk to her by pressing A at the same time I press D-pad right to open up the map, then that automatic item wheel pull will get interrupted by my map pull and allow me to warp away without checking whether Iza can see me or not. This is phase one of getting bombs, but the trick's not over yet. This bomb bag from Iza is special in that it's the Lent bomb bag. She is supposed to take this bomb bag back after completing her minigame. And the game tries to prevent this bomb bag from being stolen by deleting it from Link's inventory if the player saves and quits. We are going to be saving and quitting to save time later in the run, so I'll need to get this bomb bag from the underwater Goron by blowing up his rock using one of the bombs I just got from Iza. It's not as easy as it sounds though. I'm now going to side hop and frame perfectly pull a bomb so that, as you could see, it was lit underwater. I timed that side hop and bomb pull to coincide with the cutscene of this chest appearing so that the bomb could sink low enough in the water during the cutscene that it would actually reach the Goron at the bottom. This trick is called Norgor and is unfortunately a very risky trick as it can only be attempted once, and failing it requires a pretty major reroute. Not all runners go for this trick, but with recent developments in the trick, it saves a lot more time now than it used to, and I chose to go for it here. 
Now that I've got my permanent bomb bag, I'll still need to fill it with water bombs in order to do the breathing underwater trick that will come up later. By default, the bomb bag is full of normal bombs, so I will now begin emptying the bomb bag over the course of this overworld movement and the coming dungeon. Dropping all of these bombs will look rather silly, but at least to me, it adds an engaging element to some otherwise unremarkable overworld movement. This upcoming dive, for instance. Anyway, we're still working towards beating Lake Bed Temple, but since we're already here, it's going to be convenient to go to Snow Peak Ruins first. The dungeon item in Snow Peak Ruins, the ball and chain, is required for beating the game. There's one required use in the Zant boss fight. And to get there, I'm going to do this trick with my map, which looks like normal warping away, but then I don't warp away. What I did there is kind of similar to what I did talking to Iza and warping away earlier. I pressed the map button on the same frame that I pressed the Z button to call Midna. On the map, I selected a portal to warp to, but then the Midna call interrupted the warp, and this results in what we call a map glitch. When a warp begins, load zones and void planes are deactivated, and although the warp was interrupted, the load zones and void planes in this area are deactivated. So while normally I wouldn't be able to run through this fog without first obtaining the Reekfish scent, I can simply run through it with map glitch. If I were to need the Reekfish scent, then I would have needed to get the Zora armor, gotten the coral earring, and fished for a Reekfish, which would have taken a lot of time. Here are some more quick climbs on these ledges. Uh, that is not a quick climb. Uh, okay, I got, I got them both eventually. You may be wondering, how am I going to get out of this area if load zones and void planes are deactivated? Well, very conveniently, we still can activate the Howling Stone that's at the top of Snow Peak. We won't need the Golden Wolf and the hidden skill associated with it, so we don't need to howl a second time to spawn the Golden Wolf on the map. We'll just howl once to get ourselves out of this area, deactivate map glitch, and then come back. Interestingly, because load zones are deactivated, if I had tried to dig into the cave that I'm about to dig into without deactivating map glitch first, then I would have softlocked. Link would have been forever digging through the hole. Oh no. Well, that was almost a smooth cave. Now that we're at the top of Snow Peak, we'll need to snowboard down to get to the dungeon, but beforehand, there's a messenger fight for a warp portal. However, we have no need to get this portal, we never need to warp here. So we'll simply do an LJA in this direction, and that'll take us far enough that the game is convinced that we must have passed the Shadow Beast fight already, and we'll respawn beyond it. Unfortunately, we won't be going on a spiritual journey with Yeto. It takes very slightly longer to do so. The thick snowy fog pervading this area doesn't persist after the Shadow Beast fight, it clears. But because we skip the Shadow Beast fight altogether, this area will stay foggy, and that means that snowboarding down to the dungeon won't have great visibility. As you can see, Yeto is completely obscured by the fog during most of that cutscene. It also unfortunately means that the rupees that are usually along the snowboarding path don't spawn, so we can't use them in our rupee route. During this snowboarding section, I'll be staying airborne as much as I reasonably can, as Link's speed is highest when he's in the air during this section. Of course, this adds an additional challenge, as we can't turn while airborne. Let's see how many quick spins I can do on this big jump. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, only five. I can sometimes squeeze a sixth in there. Now I'll be taking the slightly risky shortcut just to go fast. Uh, I'm using a mountain in the distance as a visual cue to guide me to this ramp.
And now we can enter Snow Peak Ruins. In a casual playthrough, this would be the fifth dungeon that the player would encounter. But for us, it'll be the third dungeon that we've entered, and we haven't completed any dungeons yet. As I mentioned before, we also won't be completing this dungeon. All we really need to do here is get the ball and chain. We'll only need to make our way across a few rooms to get to the dungeon's mini-boss, Darkhammer, that guards the ball and chain. We'll start with a pretty big sequence break by LJAing across this large gap. This will allow us to claw shot up to the second floor through this bombable floor with no collision on the bottom. In this room and the next one, we'll just be dropping some bombs as we make our way closer to Darkhammer. Note that the game limits us to having three bombs out at a time, which is why I'm sometimes not dropping bombs. Oh no. Dropping all of these bombs while moving usually means pulling the bomb and then pressing B as soon as the bomb is fully out to drop it with the sword and not interrupt Link's movement. I accidentally pressed B twice there and got a jump slash. A huge wall of ice ostensibly blocks our progress in this room, but by transforming into a wolf in a specific spot, I missed it. And then turning, we can get that lower ledge on the floor to push us, causing us to click through the ice. And unfortunately, the locations of those mini freezers are just RNG. This series of rooms was our fastest way to access this half of the outdoor courtyard. From here, we'll skip the puzzle of lugging a bunch of cannonballs around the dungeon by using the freezer that guards Darkhammer's door to clip out of bounds through the door. You can see here that even though I've gotten out of bounds, I haven't hit the load zone for Darkhammer's room, and that is because, with a few exceptions, load zones are tied to doors in this game. So simply making it past a door is not enough, we still have to be able to open it. And that's why there's only one boss key skip that we can do. In the Darkhammer fight, we'll simply drop a bomb behind the mini boss and wait for it to explode while avoiding the ball and chain. I will get rid of a few extra bombs along the way. That bomb will do most of the damage that Darkhammer can take, and then a jump slash and quick spin will finish him off. As a side note, you heard me correctly before, this bright and shiny boss wielding a ball and chain is called Darkhammer. Go figure. As I mentioned before, all we strictly need in this dungeon is the ball and chain, but since we're here we might as well get some convenient rupees. There is an orange rupee, worth 100 rupees, in a bubble that hides in this suit of armor. And I'll now save warp to get back to the dungeon entrance, where there's another suit of armor containing a bubble with an orange rupee in it. I will stand in a very specific place when using the ball and chain to break the suit of armor, as standing in the wrong place and doing it can result in the bubble landing out of bounds, and the rupee becoming unobtainable without reloading the save. With all of that done, we will finally use Uku, which we got in Lakebed Temple, to return to that dungeon so we can finish it. I unfortunately failed to fully empty my bomb bag before save warping after getting the ball and chain, so I'll need to re-equip the bomb bag here to drop the last bomb before opening this chest to fill my bag with water bombs. I'll now make my way through the first couple of rooms of the dungeon in much the same way as I did earlier when I came here for the claw shot. I mentioned during Snow Peak a few minutes ago that there were just a few exceptions to the rule of load zones being tied to doors in this game. And one big exception is the load zone for the boss room in Lakebed Temple. Instead of the door leading directly to the fight, the door leads to a small chamber where there is a hole containing the load zone. As such, we won't need to get the boss key. Instead, we can just get onto this railing to clip out of bounds. Then use a position setup so that we can successfully get into that chamber without avoiding. And finally enter the boss fight.
This slow drop from the load zone to the trigger that starts the fight is a thread that holds this route together, as you'll see that Link has just enough air to reach the bottom, and starting the fight will very conveniently refill his air meter. In this first phase of the fight, all I need to do is claw shot the eye out of the tentacle, and do enough damage to it that we won't see the second cycle of this, we'll just move straight on to phase 2. We can do this very easily with the Master Sword, as the game still doesn't expect us to have it by this point. And now we see what this bomb business was all about. Link is only able to pull out water bombs underwater when he's wearing the iron boots and standing on the ground. However, it's possible to take off the iron boots by equipping something over them on the X or Y button while Link is pulling out the bomb. And if the player does that, then Link will be swimming with the water bomb. If the player then releases the water bomb while swimming with it, then Link's air meter will be refilled allowing us to very carefully make our way through the entire game without the Zora armor. We don't know exactly why this works, but it does. It takes three cycles of clawing onto Morfield to kill her, and the standard Morphe fight uses two bombs to do this. With very good RNG, it's possible to do this with only one bomb, using a regrab that we'll see in just a moment. But I wasn't comfortably able to go for it this run, and it risks drowning, which is a four or five minute time loss. The way that I'm going to be able to use only two bombs to finish the three cycles on Morfield is by force on equipping my iron boots while riding her, which launches Link off of her in such a way that he can re-grab onto her without sinking all the way to the ground. In the one bomb version of this fight, we would have needed to latch onto Morfield for the first time with enough air that we could do two of those re-grabs in a row without running out. Twilight Princess speedrunners often hear the question, where does all the water go as it exits Morfield's arena? The answer is, I'm drinking it. I'm very well hydrated. Our reward for killing Morpheal is a heart container and the third fused shadow, or at least what's intended to be the third fused shadow. Because we didn't beat Forest Temple or Goron Mines, this is actually the only fused shadow that we have, but because it's the third of the set of three, the game assumes that we've gotten the other two and we can progress as though we've gotten all three. Getting this heart container is far from required, but this run is from when Stallard Skip was still pretty newly being implemented in runs, and I was very new at it myself, so I got the heart container for safety for that trick. I mentioned during the Master Sword cutscene an hour ago that the crystal we were seeing Midna hold up was implanted into Link's forehead during the cutscene we skip after Lakebed Temple. We just skipped that cutscene. Following Lakebed Temple, we enter a section of the game called Midna's Desperate Hour, where we need to save Midna by bringing her to Zelda. This involves quite a bit of running straight like we did in Lanier Twilight, so I'll be quiet and let you enjoy the music. Oh, my God. 
The sequence requires entering Telma's bar, getting kicked out, and talking to Louise the cat. And I will be going for a very small time saver known as Louise Glitch by B attacking at the very top of the steps here. I can prevent the camera from reacting the way it's supposed to to the cutscene trigger. And we'll get to see Link teleport as the camera is supposed to be facing away. The teleporting is irrelevant, but the camera not panning during the cutscene does actually save us a little bit under two seconds. This section of the run doesn't feature any big tricks, but there is one very difficult part of it, and that is navigating the ropes in Telma's bar and in the sewers. The ropes are treacherous, and every Twilight Princess runner has had an experience of trying to get on the ropes and jumping to their doom. I will be very careful around them. One of the many side quests that we skip in any percent is collecting the 60 pose around Hyrule. However, we do need to kill this one and a few more in Arbiter's Grounds just to make it through the story. Nice bonk. On the second of the two upcoming ledges, there is another possible quick climb. Let's see if I get it. Very nice. And we'll transform the human to use the lantern on this web before transforming back to wolf to continue on through the sewers. The reason we didn't transform to use the lantern on the first of the two webs is that human link's movement is incredibly slow in this area. You can see that even wolf link isn't moving very fast. So we would have needed to transform back into a wolf and that would have cost too much time. Unfortunately, at the bottom of this staircase, I will need to kill this Bulblin Archer, because unless you're a Tass, it is otherwise impossible to get to the top of the room without getting hit by him. After this rope are some shorter ropes, and I'll be able to jump across the gaps to skip the ropes. In this outdoor rooftops area, there is a wind cycle, and that wind cycle controls the position of a bridge near the end. With good movement, I'll be able to make an early cycle on that bridge, and not need to stop and wait for it. It's tight enough that it always looks a little bit risky, but the real risk is that the bridge's collision is not very good, and sometimes Wolf Link falls straight through it. Thankfully, the bridge was nice to me there. Now we conclude Minda's Desperate Hour by meeting Zelda and healing Minda. I mentioned earlier that we howled at a particular stone to spawn a wolf in a convenient location for learning Ending Blow. This is that convenient location. We spawn here after Minda's Desperate Hour, and the wolf is very close by.
First we'll take a scripted loss and get knocked down by the hero shade. One extremely minor but somewhat interesting thing to note here is that Link's starting position relative to the hero shade is different depending on which golden wolf he's gone to. If we had gotten ending blow from the golden wolf that the game intends us to, then Link would have spawned a little bit farther away from the hero shade, meaning that in the first phase of the fight, he would have been too far away to stab the hero shade. We would have had to do a jump attack or move forward a little bit first. And with that, we will be able to finish the game. Eventually. Interestingly, one element of this hidden skill learning sequence that is controlled by where Link would normally learn Ending Blow is where he spawns after getting the hidden skill. We just spawned in Farron Woods, where the Golden Wolf that we skipped was. This kind of wrong warp can be accessed with other Golden Wolves and hidden skills in the game, but it works out to never be useful for the speedrun because the wrong warps are always backtracking rather than moving forward to a new area. I said earlier that everything in early game was leading up to the goal of beating Lakebed Temple, and now that we've done that and completed Midna's Desperate Hour, we have access to the desert, which will in turn grant us access to the Mirror Chamber and the rest of the game. Boy, that was a long ladder I just climbed. Hope I don't need to climb any more of those. Oh no. For anyone interested, I did just climb that ladder for 18 seconds. But it was for a good reason. I need to talk to Aru up here to get his memo, and then give it to Fire to launch to the desert. It is thankfully a little quicker getting down. In many cases, we avoid transforming unnecessarily to cross short distances, and although this distance may seem kind of short, Wolf Link is so much faster in this area than Human Link and can jump these larger gaps, uh, making Wolf Link, well, to theoretically jump those larger gaps, making it worthwhile to transform into Wolf Link. Interestingly, in categories that get the Zora armor, it's faster to jump straight from Aru's tower into the water and swim over as Zora armor increases Link's swimming speed. We now enter the desert, which is the only other part of the run where we'll just be running straight for a while. So, enjoy the music. It is unfortunate that with this route we end up getting to the desert in the daytime, as this cutscene of the Bulwin Sentinel and the Boar Riders would not activate if it were nighttime. In a casual playthrough, one would be expected to knock a rider off of its boar, steal the boar, and ride it through these wooden barricades. But fortunately for us, since we've already been to Snow Peak, we can use the ball and chain to break this tower, and then clip past the next fence. There is a way to do that clip as wolf, which can be faster than doing it as human, but it's a bit finicky. In this upcoming area, we'll see a use of map glitch again. In Snow Peak, we used it to get past voiding out in the fog. Here we'll use the same mechanic for a slightly different purpose, 
We want to defeat King Bulblin in the center of the camp as quickly as possible, and to skip getting the small key from a Bulblin on the far side of the camp, we'll be using an LJA to get out of bounds, and then jump attacking below the void plane of the area to hit the King Bulblin fight trigger underground. Although there appears to be a solid ground in this out-of-bounds area, there really is not. You can see on the mini-map that Link is traveling towards the center of the camp, and we have now hit the fight trigger. King Goldwyn now performs his dance for us. What a nice dance. Although we skipped an action-packed boar riding sequence earlier, we will get one now as we open the path to Arbiter's Grounds. Here is where it starts to feel like we've begun the second half of the run. While the first half of the run kind of focused on big sequence breaking tricks, the second half of the run is mostly dungeons, and there are quite a few difficult things that we'll be doing in the dungeons, but it feels a little different. That said, the biggest sequence break of all in this run is coming up after this dungeon. There are surprisingly many ways to cross this first room. I prefer to claw shot and then roll across the platforms. Some people roll to the first platform rather than claw shotting. In some categories we'd be a wolf here, so we'd B attack across the room as wolf. And if you watch a task, you'll either see Link do an LJA across the first half of the room, or across the entire room with a break slide, which is a piece of movement tech that I will be using later on in the dungeon. This upcoming room doesn't look like anything special, but it is interestingly one of the only required uses of the lantern in the entire run. That said, if we somehow found a way to get through the entire run without using the lantern, we probably still would as it's pretty fast. And now we enter the central room of the dungeon. We'll be coming through this room a lot of times. The intended format of this dungeon is that Link must collect the souls from the four Poes that are currently traveling through this big door in order to open the door and progress to the rest of the dungeon where he'll get the dungeon item, the boss key, and finally fight the boss. Kind of similarly to how the game treats the fused shadows and the mirror shards, it doesn't actually check that Link has gotten all four Poe souls. In this case, it checks for the second, third, and fourth ones. In a casual playthrough, Link would obtain the Poe scent from the first Poe, and that would allow him to progress to the second one. However, we'll be able to make our way to another Poe to get the scent, and completely skip the first Poe. See ya. This room is pretty clearly not meant to be crossed from this side, but with an LJA we can make it most of the way across the sand, and then clip up using this pillar to jump to this ledge. From there we can LJA across the remaining gap, and cross the room entirely. You'll notice in this room and others that I try to avoid walking in the sand. As you saw between the LJAs in the previous room, Link walks very slowly in the sand. This is the issue that brake sliding, the technique I mentioned earlier, is going to help us with. But again, we're not quite there yet.
Having done that sequence breaking in the dungeon, this first Poe that we're going to fight is actually the intended fourth Poe, and as such its fight sequence is a little bit special, it will spawn three copies of itself, and we need to choose the right one to attack. Unfortunately, these Poe's spin around Link for a time that is determined by RNG, but we do have an RNG manipulation for the second cycle that will prevent the Poe's from spinning slowly around us. Because the Poe appeared below Link, I'll do a B attack in the sand, and the pose will start circling quickly again. There is a way of doing that second cycle of the fight in a way that will consistently cause the Poe to land near the exit door of the room. I unfortunately wasn't feeling very comfortable with it when I did this run. Now before we leave the room, I'll be sniffing the Poe, to again get the Poe scent that we were meant to get from Poe 1. Ostensibly, this just allows us to see the Poe scent trails that guide us to the Poe's, but in fact the game will not allow Link to dig up a pole chain to get to the second Poe if he doesn't have the scent already. In preparation for getting to the third Poe later, I'm going to push this block four times. If I push it fewer times than that, then it won't stay pushed when I come back to the room. I mentioned a while ago that we were going to need to get 300 rupees over the course of the run in order to pay fire to fix the cannon and Arbiter's Grounds has some convenient red rupees worth 20. If I had gotten more RNG rupees earlier on in the run, then I could have skipped that chest, as it's a bit slow. Hi, Poe One. Here's the pole chain that the game would not let us dig up if we had not gotten the Poe send. I'll need to use the central column to turn this room in order to get up to Poe 2, but while I'm down here I'll also get a small key, for use later. And while I'm at it, I can also get the red ruby that the skip there drops. The Poe 2 fight sequence will be a bit simpler than the Poe 4 fight sequence was. One thing to note though is that I'll attack the Poe here before it becomes vulnerable. That skipped a short animation of the Poe noticing Link. As we've seen in quite a few other places in this run, there will be one frame for input between the Poe Soul text box and the cutscene afterwards. On that one frame, I was able to input a neutral B attack, which gets Link a little bit closer to the door. In a task of this room, the bubbles would be manipulated to push Link nearly all the way to the door during the cutscene. In this next room, I'll be going for a trick called Speed Rat, where we manipulate a rat at the bottom of the room to attack Link right as the game considers him to have started pushing this turn key. Since the turning sequence has been initiated, it will continue even though Wolf Link is no longer there, allowing us to run straight to the door. Interestingly, in a casual playthrough, opening that door before the turning animation has finished would cause a soft lock, as the orientation of that room affects the orientation of the room above it. However, in the speedrun's case, that's not an issue, as we'll be approaching our final Poe from an unintended direction. The game intends for us to approach the final Poe from the opposite side of the dungeon, but since we did our sequence break earlier and pushed that box, nice bonk, we're able to climb up to the upper floor of the dungeon this way. And we won't see it, but we will hear that we are using our small key on the upcoming door, as there is a lock on the other side. Since we'll be going through the upcoming room backwards, the enemies won't all notice us in the normal way. This will allow me to carefully prepare a mid and charge attack in order to kill this Gibdo from behind before he notices me and to ignore the other Gibdo altogether. This red rupee that the Gibdo drop fills my wallet to 300, and now I have enough to fix the Sky Cannon. If my movement in this room looks at all peculiar, it's because I'm being very careful so that I can target the Poe Soul once the Poe is knocked down. With so many enemies in the room, it's unfortunately common to knock the Poe down, but then only be able to target the Stalkin, the small skeleton enemies, and have the Poe get back up.
Now we've done our Po fights. As you can see from these torches, we've collected four Po souls. Well, maybe not, but the door's gonna open anyway. This grants us access to the second half of the dungeon, which is one of the hardest sections of the run. There's a lot to do. The biggest sequence break in this dungeon comes up now, where we get the boss key early by simply be attacking across this sand pit. It's possible to do this without even clipping out of bounds, though I did just there. Because of that sequence break, we'll be traveling through some rooms backwards now. For a long time, runners would transform into Wolf Link to cross these rooms, but it turns out that we can do some parkour instead to cross the rooms faster as human and save ourselves two transforms. Now we'll finally see an example of the brake sliding I mentioned earlier. If Link has an initial speed, and we hold target and a control stick direction opposite his speed, but just outside the control stick's dead zone, then Link will enter a strange animation that allows him to slide through sand very quickly. We'll now use some well-placed bombs to kill the Stalfos and make our way to the door that killing the Stalfos opens while we wait out the bomb timers. Now we enter the dungeon mini-boss room. This mini-boss is Death Sword, and Death Sword guards the spinner. We will need the spinner, but to get it, we actually won't be fighting Death Sword. We will need to get through phase one of the fight, where we transform into Wolf, see Death Sword with our senses, and cause it to go flying around the room. But in a speedrun, we ideally don't want to finish the fight, as finishing the fight causes a long cutscene to play, where the room gets brighter. Instead, I'm going to tag Death Sword with the claw shot so that it starts chasing Link around the room, and then lure it to a very specific position near the gate that leads us to the spinner. Conveniently, over top of this gate, there is a large gap through which Link is meant to exit this room once he's gotten the spinner. But by luring Death Sword to this corner, walking to a very specific place, and releasing him into charge attack, we can use a super jump to land up on that ledge and skip the rest of the fight. This trick is quite hard and really only saves about 15 seconds over an optimal fight. It was found quite a while ago, but only somewhat recently started becoming commonplace in runs. Although I have the spinner, Death Sword is still alive and I'm still locked into this room, so I'm going to save warp to get back to the entrance to the dungeon. From there, we'll approach Stallard, the boss. Having save warped, I will be backtracking through several rooms of the dungeon now to get through the Poe door again. As an aside, there is a way to get through the Poe door without opening it, which would mean not needing the three Poe souls that we got and skipping a lot of things in the first half of the dungeon. The reason that I didn't do that in this run is that it takes about 10 hours because it involves a technique known as pickup sliding. Anytime Human Link picks up an object and presents it to the camera, he's actually moving backwards very, very slowly, and ignoring collision checks. If you'd like to see this pickup slide through the Podor, check out a Twilight Princess low percent run. In the current low percent record by Link 1183, the pickup slide begins around 5 hours into the run, and ends over 14 hours into it. I mentioned that this half of the dungeon is one of the toughest sections of the run. It had some fancy parkour, it had Death Sword skip, and now we're coming up on a trick that was only very recently decided to be RTA viable in runs, called Stallard Skip. Just like the lake bed boss key door was an exception in that the door led to a room with a loading zone separate from the door, which allowed for our boss key skip, Stallard's room is different from all of the other boss rooms in the game in that there is a loading zone for the exit that's present through the entire fight, rather than exiting being tied to touching the portal that only appears once the fight has been completed. That means that if we're somehow able to get out of bounds, we can access that loading zone early and skip the fight entirely. Doing this requires a series of very precise steps. 
and I'm going to start explaining it now because there will be a lot going on. First, I'm going to use a setup to get in a very specific spot along the spinner rail surrounding Stallard. After that, I can use a technique called claw shot actor displacement to move one of the stall troops in the arena over towards the gate I want to get past. With claw shot after displacement, I'll be claw shotting the stall troop, but interrupting that claw shot by making Link fall off of a ledge with an L slide. After that, I'll be able to use another L slide while claw shotting the stall troop, this time frame perfect, to clip into one wall, and then use a bomb boost to interrupt yet another claw shot on the stall troop to boost out of bounds to where we can access the loading zone. Here is my position setup. There is a very small range of vertical angles I can use to claw shot this stall tree. Here is my claw shot actor displacement. And now I will attempt to flip into the wall with the stall tree. I got a little scared there because Stallard's flame was very close by, but it didn't hit me. As this part is frame perfect, it's unfortunately easy to fail, but luckily this part of the trick doesn't take too long to retry. Now I've clipped into the wall, and I'll throw the boomerang at Stallard to stun him. On top of this trick being difficult because of how many elements of it are very precise, we also have Stallard trying to attack us during the entire trick. Now I'll do my bomb boost, and I use a metronome to time this. I've successfully gotten out of bounds, and can roll straight to the load zone. An optimal RTA Stallard skip saves about a minute and a half, which is huge for this run's level of optimization. This trick was found years ago, but was considered to be TAS only, until a few people decided that it was time to make a setup for it, and we just got good this year. Now the purpose of going through Arbiter's Grounds in the first place was to grant us access to the Mirror Chamber, which will be our passageway to the Palace of Twilight later. So we're going to do the Shadow Beast fight to open the Warp Portal. And this fight is the first we've seen with five Shadow Beasts. Oh no. I know this looks like it was just bad RNG, the Shadow Beast didn't notice me, but that was actually my fault. I stayed too close to the center at the beginning and made those two Shadow Beasts separate too much. It's funny, but it's remarkable that this warp I'm doing right now is a normal warp. In a casual playthrough or most speedruns up to now, Midna would try to prevent Link from warping away once he's gotten to the mirror chamber, but hasn't raised the mirror yet. In speedruns, you would see us get around this by doing some zooming shenanigans with the map before warping. But that Midna text just doesn't come up if you've done Stallard Skip, so that saves a little bit of extra time. I mentioned earlier that the biggest sequence break in the entire run was still coming up in the second half. After finishing Arbiter's Grounds, the player is expected to go to Snowpeak Ruins, Temple of Time, and then do the Skybook quest in order to get access to City in the Sky. But the only thing blocking us is this owl statue that we can conveniently clip through by transforming in a very specific spot. This saves the better part of an hour and cuts out quite a bit of side questing. Funnily enough, Twilight Princess 100% does require repowering the Dominion Rod, but doesn't require filling all of the characters in the skybook. That means that we end up going through a lot of the side questing to remove that owl statue, but then just clip through it anyway. Now we finally get to spend those 300 rupees we've collected over the course of the entire run. To pay fire to fix the sky cannon over the course of a few days with the cunning use of a hammer.
With that, we enter City in the Sky. This section is rather cutscene heavy. Eek. And now the gameplay will begin. This is one of my favorite dungeons to speedrun. Right off the bat, we have an RNG-based wind cycle, and it looks like I got the bad RNG, and I'm having to roll against the wind. Not a big deal. In preparation for some LJs in the next room, I'll pull out the boomerang as I'm opening this door, saving a few frames. These LJAs will skip having to pick up the Uka and fly across the room slowly. I'm now going to transform into a wolf before opening this door, as there's a trigger right outside this door to turn on a fan in the next room, and the game doesn't consider Link to have hit the trigger if his back paws are behind it. Skipping turning on this fan is a major sequence break in the dungeon, and skips a good chunk of the second half that you would see in a 100% run. I love bonking into that load zone. As a side note, that load zone, like most in the game, is a ground trigger, but it's possible with just a side hop to get all the way over it and fall into the void out of bounds. If I wait until the bridge is almost fully extended, I'll be able to get off of the spinner and roll away early. I can now use an LJ8 across this gap slightly faster than I could claw shot over. And now we'll head over to this room to get a small key to use on the other side of the dungeon. This small key is one of the few things that a task can skip, but that a human has never successfully skipped before. It's a pretty crazy trick involving several claw shot actor displacements, bomb boosts, and extremely precise claw shot aiming. It also doesn't save very much time, so any time lost in creating a theoretical RTA viable setup would probably make the trick not worth it anymore. On the way back to the central area across this bridge, there is a trigger for a cutscene, in which Argorok would come and destroy the bridge. But by jumping on the railing on the side of the steps, we can skip the cutscene entirely. This will have the odd side effect of changing our spawn location after save warping once we've gotten the double claw shots. From here, we'll be making our way to the opposite side of the dungeon, where the double claw shots are located. In a casual playthrough, the boss key would be locked behind the double claw shots, but because we didn't turn on the fans earlier, we actually could get it now. We won't though, as it's a bit better to get later. Contrary to what the flashing A button at the bottom of the screen might have you believe, you actually don't need to press A very quickly here for the bridge to extend at full speed. Once again, I'll get off the spinner early and do one roll before the bridge is extended completely. Here's where we use the small key that we didn't skip earlier. In this room, we will completely bypass the puzzle, using an LJA to the door. I noticed there that I threw the boomerang a little bit too far to the right, so I just stopped and threw it again. 
I will also use some LJAs in this room to get through it quickly. In this room, we have two terrifying enemies to face before we can progress. This battle will be long and fought viciously. Never mind. As if that fight wasn't fast enough, it's actually possible to do it a little bit faster using only the claw shot. If Link shoots the claw shot at the back wall from the right place and at the right time, then both Dynalphos will raise their shields as if to defend themselves, and in that animation, step back and fall off the ledges. I'll now wait for a second or so before jumping with this Uka, not because I've forgotten the route, but because I needed to wait on this fan cycle. In this room, the player is meant to pull a switch to turn on a fan, much like the last room, but we'll be able to skip it using a somewhat precise angle jump. Since I have the iron boots equipped anyway, I'll put them on mid-air to fall to the ground a little bit faster, as Link's ground speed is greater than his airspeed. Our goal in this room is simply to make it to the bottom to enter the mini-boss fight, and while in this category we still do it pretty quickly by sinking with this Uka, in 100% we just free fall with the iron boots and do a jump slash at the end. The reason we do this slightly slower in any percent is that that free fall costs us two hearts, and any percent usually doesn't have very much health here. There's one framer in this room that I don't go for as it's a bit risky, but if right as Link begins dangling from this switch, the player unequips the iron boots, then Link will fall through this spinning fan during the cutscene. It looks very funny and does save a little bit of time, but failing it by being too early costs quite a bit more time. Now we enter the mini-boss fight with the Aralfos. The chest with the double claw shots is behind a gate, and by doing a position setup, I'll be able to use a very poorly thought out claw shot target to bypass the gate and the fight entirely. Similarly to after we skipped Death Sword and Arbiter's Grounds, we don't have a good way out of here, having gotten the dungeon item, so we'll save warp. I mentioned earlier that skipping the Argorok bridge cutscene would affect our save warp location, and here we'll see that. Unlike most save warps, instead of spawning at the beginning of the dungeon, we'll spawn at the small key chest that we opened earlier. The game assumes that since we never hit that cutscene, we save warped before leaving this area, and it doesn't want us to accidentally miss the cutscene. Aside from the time saved from not watching the cutscene earlier, we also don't need to worry about hitting the fan trigger that we skipped near the beginning of the dungeon. The save warp is also extremely useful for 100%, because the second half of the dungeon that 100% completes starts in that room, and that save warp reduces the backtracking significantly. At this point, the cutscene trigger is no longer there, so we can simply roll through where it used to be. Here's where we take advantage of not having turned on that fan at the beginning of the dungeon. Instead of having to go through a long series of rooms to turn off the fan from above, we can simply claw shot up from this room. Very slippery vines. Oh my. We'll need to go up one more story to get to the boss key but we can skip most of the intended path for this room with a somewhat precise claw shot. From here, we can use an upper awning to LJA to the door to the room with the boss key in it. This door is the laggiest door in the entire game. I unfortunately screwed up my movement there a little bit. Ideally, I would have jumped off of the fan blade to land on the stairs rather than before the stairs, and that way I wouldn't have taken fall damage. One would normally cross this outdoor area by turning on these fans, causing them to spin, and waiting for some cycles to claw shot across. However, we have the power of LJAs and don't need to do that. 
The upcoming double LJA was one of the most memorable parts of this speedrun, after I had seen it for the first time. That bonk will also be one of the most memorable bonks, now that I've seen it. This room is the fan tower, where we'll make our way to the boss key door. The object is to ascend it as quickly as possible, of course, and to do so, we'll try to make some somewhat tight fan cycles. Thankfully, we can just ignore the two enemies right at the beginning, as they won't attack Link unless he's on the ground. One subtle thing that I'll be doing in this room is trying to get in control of Link's claw shot as soon as possible after claw shotting onto a new fan, and to do that, I'll just be tapping the target button as soon as Link reaches the fan. I'll now aim my claw shot at a specific line on the wall, as claw shotting onto one small part of this final target will allow Link to remain facing the door instead of turning around. The final thing we need to do before beginning the boss fight is claw shot our way up the vines. The vine wall itself is very easily accessible, but Link climbs so slowly that it's worth trying to claw shot all the way at the top of the vines, which is somewhat precise. And now we enter the Argrok fight. Like almost every boss fight in this game, this fight has two phases to it. The first phase unfortunately starts off with some waiting, so I'll just have to find a way to pass the time. I waited in that area of the arena because it ensures that when Argrok comes back it won't do its claw attack. Now I can claw shot onto Argrok's tail while wearing the iron boots to drag it to the ground. Phase 1 is meant to include two cycles of this, but thankfully claw shotting quickly onto one of the columns after this cutscene allows us to do the two cycles back to back without any more waiting. Incidentally, there is a fun soft lock known as Cool Game that can be accessed in this fight. If during the first cycle of Phase 1 just now, when Argrok finished flying around the arena, I had claw shot it onto its tail on the first possible frame, the game would not have pulled Argrok down as it's supposed to, and Argrok would continue flying around the arena with Link attached to its tail. It's a very funny soft lock, but unfortunately costs something like 5 minutes, so you won't see it often in PB attempts. After this cutscene ends, to start off phase 2, we'll do what any normal person would do upon seeing a giant fire-breathing dragon, and run away. We void at the beginning of this phase to avoid having to wait again for Argrok to fly around the arena. This phase of the fight will consist of three cycles that are all pretty similar. I'll claw shot onto the top of these columns, wait for Argrok to roar, and then claw shot onto one of the P-hats surrounding the arena. However, instead of doing the casual strat of claw shotting around the entire arena, I will sink low enough on this P-hat that Argrok thinks that I've fallen to the ground. This causes Argrok to stop spewing its flame early, allowing me to get onto its back very quickly. Cycle 2 of this fight will be identical to Cycle 1, though I will point out here that I don't shoot the claw shot immediately to get onto the pillar, because it is possible, and in fact pretty easy, to accidentally get up too quickly and cause Argorok to start shooting the flame too early for the flame cancel to work.
Cycle 3 will be a little bit different from the other two, in that while shooting Flame, Argrok is going to turn 180 degrees. To counter that, we'll claw shot part of the way around the arena, but then do our Flame Skip once Argrok turns around. the Argrok fight. Our rewards for beating Argrok are this heart container and the final mirror shard which completes the Mirror of Twilight, allowing us to access Palace of Twilight. Just like with the Fused Shadows in the first half of the game, the game does not actually check whether we have all of the Mirror Shards, it only checks for the final piece. This is why we were able to skip Temple of Time entirely, and to leave Snowpeak Ruins without beating the boss. Although it's not technically required, this category does get this heart container as we took a heart of damage voiding during the fight, and we'll take two more hearts of damage falling to a bridge, leaving City in the Sky. If I had gotten up to full health during phase one of the fight, when hearts were freely available, then that would leave me at one heart entering Palace of Twilight, which is not a great idea, considering that it's easy to take damage there by accident, and we intentionally take some damage in some parts of the dungeon. Before getting into the Sky Cannon to return to Lake Hylia, I'll be putting on the Iron Boots. Normally the Sky Cannon would launch Link into the water, but if we have the Iron Boots on and do a jump slash, then we can land on the bridge, and that'll allow us to warp to the Mirror Chamber sooner. Because we have all of the mirror shards now, we can enter Palace of Twilight without having raised the mirror. Even though the cutscene is automatically transforming me into a human, it will be faster to transform back into a wolf before entering the dungeon. This is not just because Wolf Link moves faster than Human Link, but because Midna wants to tell us some stuff as we enter this dungeon, and having her on Wolf Link's back skips the animation of her popping out of Link's shadow. This second set of text boxes is technically skippable with an LJA, but it's exceptionally precise and only done in Tassus. Palace of Twilight is by far the least broken dungeon in the run. We're essentially just going to do a fast, casual playthrough of it. We're going to enter every room in the dungeon and get every key. That doesn't mean, however, that there isn't something to pay attention to in every room. In this room, for example, I'll want to attack the Zant Head in a particular way so that I can hit it twice in one attack killing it faster than I normally could. Unfortunately, I can't do the same kind of double hit on the Zant head in this room as it doesn't rise high enough off of the ground. But while I'm waiting for the head to explode, I can try to get as close to the chest spawn as possible. Yeah. <laughs> 
During the Phantom Zant fights, I'll be doing very specific amounts of damage to Phantom Zant on each cycle, in order to prevent him from starting to rapidly warp around the room. On each cycle, I will do one normal B attack, followed by two quick spins, and on the final cycle, I'll add a third quick spin to end the fight. You can almost always tell during the Phantom Zant fight whether the runner is wearing headphones or not by how they react to Phantom Zant spawning. The goal of the first half of the dungeon is to bring the souls that are in the hands in the Phantom Zant rooms back to the outdoor area to obtain the light sword. This involves quite a bit of claw shotting, and thus quite a few L slides. By throwing the soul into the socket, right as this hand cutscene begins, we can cause this cutscene to overlap with the cutscene of the stairs rising. In this room, I'll want to get the soul into the socket in the center of the room, while Link is standing where the stairs will rise to their highest point. To do that, I use an angle setup, as it costs quite a bit of time to miss the throw. As usual, I'll do an L slide while claw shotting the soul here, but there's more than meets the eye to this one, as there are supposed to be four of the Twilight Vermin enemies, which I have dubbed Squeebles, that spawn there but else sliding there prevents them from spawning, and I have no idea why. In this room, I can simply run past all of the enemies and around the gang of squeebles at the end. That is one soul down, one to go. I want to give a shout out here to a really cool, but unfortunately completely useless glitch in Twilight Princess. If you claw shot a soul in just the right way as it's rolling into its socket, then Link will pick up the soul and have a ridiculous amount of speed, as though the speed of the soul in the claw shot was transferred to Link himself. We unfortunately haven't been able to do it with any other claw shotable item in the game, and it doesn't really work out to save any time in Palace, but it is a thing that is possible. This is a room that speedrunners have affectionately, or not so affectionately, dubbed Stupid Room, as it is quite stupid. Any small mistake in this room can yield a humongous time loss. This next room features some well choreographed combat. I'll first throw the boomerang in order to stun the first two shadow beasts, which will cause them to follow Link over to the third shadow beast, where they can all be killed together. Next, I'll kill this Zant head in such a way that I am launched towards the center of the room, where the next three Zant heads will spawn, and I'll be able to tag them quickly with the charge attack. Next, if I'm quick enough, I can claw shot up to one of the targets on the wall before the cutscene of the chest spawning begins. Okay, that wasn't even close. It's possible to claw shot onto that target before even going into first person mode, which looks very cool, it doesn't save very much time. But I usually go for it as I got quite a bit of practice on it when I was doing Palace individual level speedruns. Which, for anyone who doesn't know, are speedruns that begin at the entrance of Palace of Twilight and end when you complete the dungeon. Just a short dungeon speedrun that feels nice to optimize. Thank <laughs> you. 
The plan for this second Phantom Zant fight is identical to the plan for the first. This time though, I will grab the soul a little bit differently. In the other room, if I took too long, Midna would have popped up with some text. But in this room, what I want to avoid is grabbing the soul from too far away. If I were to do that, then this hand cut scene would begin while the soul was still in the claw shot, and the soul would be dropped. With a carefully timed soul drop and roll, I can get onto these stairs before they begin to rise. This next room is quite complicated, but I will attempt to give a detailed description as we go. First, I'll run straight. Yep, that's that room. Thankfully, traversing Stupid Room on the way back is not nearly as harrowing an experience as it was on the way to the soul. That said, you'll notice I only jumped one platform there. It is possible to jump to the second platform before waiting, but it is risky enough that I don't go for it in any percent runs. It's not too common for the keys to be a nuisance while riding this platform, but just in case, I'm going to get them in the boomerang, so they can't bother me. Between this door animation and the cutscene of the Twilight being affected by the soul, there's one frame where I can throw the soul. No, I didn't get it. So instead I'm just going to drop it with the sword and claw shot it from pretty far away. While the soul is rolling towards its socket, we have a brief skydiving interlude. Whee! In place of a dungeon item in Palace of Twilight, the Master Sword is upgraded to the Light Sword. The Light Sword kills all Twilight enemies in one hit, which is very convenient for the second half of the dungeon, as it means we won't be transforming back and forth between human and wolf. Glitch hunters in the past have considered how it might be possible to skip getting the Light Sword in this dungeon, as we can see the door we're approaching to the North Wing from beyond this Twilight Waterfall. It turns out that it is actually possible to get past this waterfall without the light sword, but there are uses activating souls later on that we don't know how to bypass. I'll be completing this next room in pretty much the intended way, but I do want to give a shout out to a very cool strat, Key Super Jump, that can be done in this room. If I were to get to the other side of the room, target one of the keys in the boomerang, and make a few other well-placed targets so that I could transform into a wolf and tag the keys with a midna charge attack, then I could use the keys to launch myself up to the second floor. It looks very cool, but unfortunately saves a maximum of about two seconds. Oh no, I missed the throw. I forgot about that. Anyway, the key super jump looks very cool, but it doesn't save a lot of time overdoing this room well, which I didn't just now, and also relies on the RNG-based movement of both the squeebles in the room and the keys. I can speed up this part of the room just a little bit by using LJA to get across the gap faster than the light platform would take me. I can also activate this trio of souls right now, so that the light platform is waiting for me after I get the small key. Finally, I can do another LJA from this platform to the end of the room. 
For LJAs like this one, that rely on the boomerang going out of bounds between two points on a flat or nearly flat surface, I always buffer the LJA by pulling the item wheel to see whether the boomerang is actually out of bounds, because sometimes it just doesn't go out of bounds, and falling at that point in the room would have cost me the better part of a minute. In this area we can get the boss key, and I could go and get it now, but it's a little bit faster to get it after getting this far zant head, because of the way that the zant head cycles line up. After taking care of some cargo rocks, I'll shimmy to the right side of the platform, so that the zant head spawns as early as possible. And now I'll use an LJA to get over to the platform a little bit faster than the light platform would take me. That one I didn't need to buffer as the boomerang's path is reliable. I'll now void out as soon as the Zan head explodes to get back to the main area without another long light platform ride. After respawning, these Zan heads are present, but the cycle doesn't allow for killing them all in one go straight away. So I'm going to go get the boss key first, and if I do it right, then once I have it, they'll be in a part of their cycle where I can kill all of them at once. Unlike the room I described earlier where I ran straight, this room actually is a bit complex, in that I have zant head cycles and platform cycles to worry about. Until recently I did what many runners do, which is to call Midna right here, which doesn't delay the shadow beasts falling, but does pause the light platform at the top of the room, making the platform cycle easier to make. However, because of the zant head cycles, that ends up costing about half a second. To still make that platform cycle, I will be doing an LJA here. And I will need to claw shot up to the next two platforms pretty much as early as possible. Here I will terrifyingly roll to the edge of this platform, to grab the ledge so I can get all the way in the corner. Now that I've killed that Zant head, the cycle for the other Zant head has begun, and I've made my platform cycle. Unfortunately, because of this cycle, I will still need to wait for that Zant head to respawn. If I had delayed killing the first Zant head as late as possible while still being able to make the platform cycle, then it actually would have been possible for me to kill the second Zant head without waiting, but this is extremely difficult as it's so tight on time, and so far, although people have done it before, no one has done it in a run of any kind. Here I'll do one last LJA to skip a platform ride. And now we enter one of the least stressful rooms in the dungeon, where I just have to kill a few shadow beasts. This room is a pretty reliable source of health, though I didn't get much this time. Health going into the Zant fight matters quite a bit more in 100% runs and ILs, as those have great spin, which is a powerful sword technique that requires full health to use. Now we enter the Zant fight, which is a very fun boss fight. It's almost in the style of the boss rush, as it calls back to mini boss and boss fights that came earlier in the game. That said, there will be phases based on the Dangoro and Blazetta fights, which any percent does not do. Hey Zant, what do you think of that chocolate chip cookie you just ate? Yeah, I enjoyed mine too.
Damage works in an interesting way in the Zant fight. In most phases, what will matter is that we land the final attack of two combos on Zant, with the other parts of the combos not mattering, and normally powerful attacks like the quickspin and the jump attack not doing anything special. Here I'll start a combo early to try to get the last part of the combo out as soon as Zant lands on the ground. Both this phase and the next phase have one cycle variants. The one for this phase is frame perfect and doesn't save very much time, so I don't go for it. But the one for this next phase has a two frame window and saves a bit more time, so I will be going for it. To set up for it, as soon as I can catch up to Zant, I will do a jump attack plus quick spin, and then part of a combo, trying to time the remainder of the combo to land on Zant just when he tries to warp away. And unfortunately, I held the middle of the combo for a little bit too long, so I failed the one cycle there. And you can see why you want to go for the one cycle on this one. This third phase is why our bomb routing earlier in the run was so complicated. We needed to get the permanent bomb bag so that we would still have bombs by this point. Fortunately though, unlike in the Morpheal fight, everything in this fight is completely under our control. There is no risk of drowning from any RNG components. I will be tight on air after completing this combo on Zant, so I will be sure to use the fastest combo, which is done by holding right, then left, then up, then down, while swinging the sword. Once again, I've refilled my air by pulling a water bomb and force unequipping the iron boots, then dropping the water bomb. To last through the remainder of the fight, I will need to do that just one more time and I'm hanging out on this side of the arena to prompt Zant to spawn on the opposite side, as he always spawns in the head that is farthest away from Link. Unfortunately, although I'm trying to do that fast combo a second time, the camera was oriented in a strange way and I accidentally got some other moves out. The ball and chain will be very convenient to use in this phase of the fight, as we can use it to easily knock Zant off of the center totem. But in fact, the reason that we needed to get the ball and chain at all in this run is this upcoming phase. As far as we know, there is no way to make Zant vulnerable during this phase without throwing the ball and chain at his foot. Nothing else works. If it weren't for this, then any percent would skip going to Snowpeak Ruins altogether. As you can see, one challenge of this fight is that there are ice physics involved. In a casual playthrough, this final phase of the Zant fight gets very hectic and chaotic but Zant's spawns can be controlled with the correct approach. Thus concludes the Zant fight. Hey Zant, can you remind me what it was like riding that roller coaster last week? Oh, now I remember. For the same reasons I transformed into a wolf entering the dungeon, I'm going to transform into a wolf again here, as it'll save a little bit of time despite not having much distance to cover. Completing Palace of Twilight is what will allow us to break the barrier and finally enter Hyrule Castle to finish the game.
Before we get to Hyrule Castle though, there are two things in our way. First is the postman, who really wants to deliver some mail to us. His intentions are good, but receiving mail is rather slow, so we'll LJA over the trigger instead. The remaining obstacle is this guy. I mentioned near the beginning of the run that the Master Sword cutscene is one of the longest unskippable cutscenes in the game. This is another of the longest unskippable cutscenes in the game, wherein Midna shows us her cool hat and then turns into a squid. If you need to get some water, go to the bathroom, grab a snack, or bake a potato, now's your time. Now we are on to the final dungeon in the game, Hyrule Castle. This dungeon is less linear than some of the other dungeons, and there's quite a bit that's skippable without any glitches. For example, we won't be seeing the east side of the dungeon at all. Here we encounter the first of several barriers that we'll see in the dungeon. A crowd of Bacoblins will attack Link, and he will pull a bomb to kill all of them. In this next area is another barrier, but we'll be able to bypass it by running into it, skipping the cutscene before it fully forms, and then running back out of it. This saves quite a bit of time. In this area, we encounter King Bulblin for the last time in the run. I'll need to be at least a little bit careful, as one hit from him would kill me. And as a reward, he will give us that shiny small key on his belt. After this cutscene of King Bulbin riding away, I'll be save warping to get back to the start of the dungeon. Like we've seen in many places so far, there will be one frame between this cutscene and some Midna text where I can input a backflip and save warp early. But unfortunately I didn't get it.
As I mentioned before, there is quite a bit more to this dungeon off to the right, but it's not required, and this is any percent, so we will just head straight into the castle. This upcoming room will feature a barrier skip similar to the one that we just saw on the way to King Bulblin. When Link hits the trigger for the barrier and it starts to form, he will automatically start walking into it. But if we hit the trigger while he's mid-air, then he can't start walking into it, and if we skip the cutscene sufficiently quickly, we can just walk right by it. Interestingly, failing to skip the barrier and getting stuck inside is faster to back up with a save warp than with killing the enemies inside the barrier, as they take a while to spawn, and then the cutscene of the chest spawning afterwards is extremely laggy. We fight quite a few Dark Nuts over the course of a 100% run, but in this run, this is the only one. We'll just need to find its vulnerable spots so that we can land 11 blows for the first phase. Sometimes its shield is unrealistically good. Then with a couple of slashes and some careful positioning, I can kill the second phase very quickly. After the chest spawns, I'll want to use the boomerang to blow out a torch, so I'm going to aim ahead of time so that I can just throw the boomerang as soon as this cutscene is over. This is another room that requires us to have the lantern. We'll just have to complete a puzzle that is the same every time. Similarly to the pair of Dynalphos in City in the Sky, these two Dynalphos can be killed by one attack in the center of them, this time with a bomb. I don't think that's close enough. Yeah, I messed that up. Fortunately, I have a spare bomb and know the backup. In the upcoming Aralthos fight, I will need to throw the boomerang at it to make it targetable, shoot the claw shot at it to bring it down to Link's level, and then I'll use the ball and chain to get a quick kill. And I threw the ball and chain. That was not what I meant. Let's see if I can still get it in one cycle, yeah. Well, what I meant to do there was to hit the Arathos with the ball and chain four times before throwing it, then finish it off with one stab. Maybe next time. The small key I just got is the final small key of the run. I will need it to open the door to get up to Zelda, but first I need to get the boss key. There's the boss key, but it's guarded by some fearsome enemies. I don't know if Link is going to be able to handle this on his own. Yep, that's it. He's doomed. Behold the exploding hawk, here to save Link from certain doom. And who's that that the hawk has brought along? Four friends. Two of whom we've seen in this run, and two of whom are total strangers. This is the Resistance, who are supposed to have been helping the player along through the story. We did meet Russell, back at the very beginning of the run before we herded goats, and we met Aru when he gave us the memo to get to the desert. But we didn't see the other two in their respective locations on the map, Ashe in the entrance to Snow Peak, and Shad in the basement of the sanctuary as we went to those places without doing the things we would have needed to do to spawn the characters. This is the final tower climb before the final boss sequence. There's an intended path for the player to take through this first room that is revealed with wolf senses, but by being quick enough and taking some jumps on corners, we can ignore it completely. Next, I will try to kill these two Lizalfos at the same time.
And there's a minor skip in this hallway. I will skip claw shot onto a close grade in favor of a farther one that is a bit more precise. By moving in a particular way, I'll be able to kill these two Lizalfos at the same time, a little bit faster than I killed the other ones. In the next room, we're coming up on a final barrier skip, which is the simplest of all. All we need to do is stand outside the barrier's forming trigger and claw shot past it. Bye, Darknut. The final boss sequence has four parts, Puppet Zelda, Beast Ganon, Horseback, and the final fight with Ganondorf. I'm going to be using the ball and chain during the Beast Ganon fight, so I'm going to equip it now. I will have plenty of free and safe time during the Zelda fight, but there is one frame at the beginning of the Zelda fight where pressing the D-pad and opening the item wheel will crash the game, so I habitually do that equip before entering the fight, just in case. The Zelda fight is an element of pure RNG right at the end of the run, which can be a bit frustrating. Zelda has three attacks, the light ball attack that you see now, a lunge attack, and an attack where she spawns a triangle of light on the ground. It'll take three of those light ball attacks bounced back at her to end the fight, so ideally we get three of those as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible is not three cycles, however. After the first ball of light, Zelda is guaranteed to give a different attack for the next cycle, and after the second ball of light, Zelda is guaranteed to give a different attack for the next three cycles, meaning that the lowest possible number of cycles is seven. In addition to this, the amount of time that Zelda takes to begin her next attack is RNG. Thus, even with a seven cycle fight, we can still lose time to just waiting. Speaking of just waiting, during this downtime when I can't be attacking Zelda regardless of what I do, I'm building a pot fort. Zelda, how could you? You broke my pot fort. I'll get you for this. Hmm. The animations for the lunge attack and the ball of light beginning are very similar so I was optimistically getting ready for a light ball attack there, and if you stand in a specific place, you can get a lunge attack to just zoom around Link in circles, which unfortunately does waste time. Next is the Beast Ganon fight, and straight away I'm going to throw the ball and chain to knock Beast Ganon down. I'm then going to perform a combo dealing a specific amount of damage to get Beast Ganon into the phase that he wanted him to be in. This fight in all dungeons and 100% runs is a lot less clumsy because we have the bow and arrow, but since we skipped Goron Mines entirely, the ball and chain will have to do. I'll do the same combo on the second cycle. And with that amount of damage, the Beast Ganon fight will be one wolf attack from being over. So I'll transform into a wolf and wait for Ganon. Thankfully, at this amount of damage, he will also spawn with just one portal appearing, rather than warping around the room several times. The next phase of the final fight is horseback. In the horseback phase, Zelda very conveniently has a bow, even though we never got one. I'll start off the fight by riding towards Ganondorf so that he swings his sword at me and becomes vulnerable. Now all I need to do is follow him around and aim Zelda's light arrows at him to make him vulnerable.
Hey Ganondorf, how many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Ten tickles. Oh, you liked that one, did you? Okay, fine. There were quite a few difficult things that I did in this run, but the final phase of the final fight is not one of them. All I'll need to do is get behind Ganondorf and attack him three times. So I'll go ahead and sign off here. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe learned something. This should serve as a pretty good representation of Twilight Princess Any% as of mid-2022. Toodles.